Hi, Roy here on my channel Roy Reads Anything, which is talking about old books and related things. And this one is about novelizations and tie-ins of BBC soap operas. So um, this came about because of a mistake I made. I misspoke in an earlier video you did when I was talking about uh, a pulp writer called Hugh Miller and how he'd gone on to write lots and lots of EastEnders, EastEnders books. And I casually said EastEnders was the BBC's first soap, which Jenny pointed out not during the video, but afterwards it isn't true. And also it was in the comments as well. And at first I thought, oh yeah, of course, there were the radio ones, but no, there were other television ones and still, still trying to cling to a thread of dignity, thought, hmm, Maybe EastEnders was the first one that was shown like multiple times a week. I don't know. No. Um, also not true. So I was completely wrong. Um, but I became interested in what the earlier soaps were. Some I some I knew about, some I didn't. And looked into that. Particularly helpful was a article called Soaps on the BBC written by a guy called Dr. Anthony McNicholas, who is at Westminster University, and that's, I'll, I'll link to it. A uh, really good article, so looking at all these soaps, many of which I hadn't heard of, some radio, some television, I thought, I wonder if... <laughs> of course you did. I wonder if they, mm. you know, if, well, if any of them had tie-in books. I knew the EastEnders ones did, um, but you know, let, let's have a look, and found that the majority of them do seem to have tie-in books, and they can be very lovely. So this is a a survey of those. I won't say a deep dive, partly because I haven't actually read the books. I've kind of acquired them, um, but they're just interesting, and some of them quite beautiful as well. And I guess it's it's also how they work relating to the main shows. I think that's interesting as well. You know, how how do they you know, what, why do they even have tie-in books, etc. So, uh, rewinding back to the beginning, apparently, uh, I should point out as well, the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, is not a state broadcaster, but it is a kind of national, funded by uh, the, the citizens of the country, um, broadcaster initially radio and then it was they had the first television channel um, and so on so and for a long time I think they might have been the only like legitimate yeah. um, sort of broadcasting there was so there are this kind of institution and they got a sort of cultural status that's different from commercial commercial stations which really makes them doing any soap operas at all slightly um, you know, has a sort of slight air of, Ooh, is this something the BBC should be doing? Says the old colonel in his bath chair, waving his stick. <laughs> um, so, the first the soap ever colonel. created by the BBC in the article was called Frontline Family. Frontline Family, what a fantastic title. So that was on the radio, and lots of interesting things about it. One being, initially, it wasn't actually broadcast in Britain. So it was made, first of all, for the American market, effectively as propaganda to help promulgate the idea that uh, America should come into the war and, and help Britain out. So portraying this ordinary family and their, their struggles was, was, was its kind of agenda. And then that broadened out to BBC's overseas network so it was then being listened to by all sorts of people not re not really in the uk um i suppose doing a similar job to the movie mrs miniver which is a great movie um again you know it's like there's the plucky brits doing their thing um so a couple of things i found in newspaper archives about that program of interesting in 1946 when it was it was sort of newsworthy that this show had gone on so long um innumerable, innumerable letters and parcels of food and clothing 
have been sent to the Grateful Family by regular listeners overseas. Almost daily, someone from abroad comes to the studio to meet the Robinsons in person. So the Frontline family, they're called the Robinsons. Um, and this thing of people thinking they're real, it seems like you get that with, with all the soaps, um, including this one. One of their cherished stories is that a very high BBC official visited Field Marshal Montgomery's caravan during the war. Montgom Monty's first words were, I have a bone to pick with you. Why have you changed the time of the Robinsons so that we can't hear them? <laughs> it's it's holiday, also, <laughs> um, yeah, also in 1946, as an instance of the heartening effect of the Robinson family during the war, the BBC received a letter from two American women who were interned in Italy. We risked the death penalty for over four years, they wrote, to listen to Frontline Family. Oh, wow. Which I found quite moving. And, you know, just that, well, that and the soldiers listening to wanting to listen to it as well, that ordinary life, unexceptional happenings, it's like if you haven't got them, you know, if it's like a, some distant thing, you, you would do anything to, 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 to experience that. Um, so, um, yes, so it was called Frontline Family and it carried on after the war when it was called the Robinson Family. And eventually it finished in 1947. Enter the book. So, more about the Robinson Family is this lovely volume here. Sorry about shiny stuff. I just, when I got these, I had to put sleeves on the dust jackets because bits would be falling off. Um, we wouldn't want that either. So shininess, rustling, there you go. Um, so this was a continuation of the popular radio serial. It had finished, so the book sort of helps give people something, something a bit more um, by Jonquil Anthony and Leslie Wilson. There's pictures of them on the, on the back. Um, Jonquil Anthony. Wrote a play called Hog's Blood and Hellebore. And um I guess what that's about. Yeah, so I love the drawing or engraving on the front. You're seeing this the street where they live, presumably. An ordinary street, um, except that you see one of the houses has been blown up, so the, the surrounding houses are sort of propped up by these these wooden um wooden posts and there's a there's a woman with a pram, you know, going going along. So it's um, really interesting sort of a document of the times. So yes, the Robinson family, they had a tie-in book. Moving on, the next one to appear was one I had actually heard of, Mrs. Dale's Diary. Yay! Mrs. Dale's Diary, which ran for a long, long, long time. Um, January 1948, ran until 1969, and had several books. I've got three of them. So this, I believe, was the first one. Mrs. Dale, 10 Years in the Life of a Doctor's Family by Arrangement with the BBC. It said that on the other one as well. Uh, and I love the cover of this, uh, um, but it's got a very modern style, the way these, these uh, the streets are drawn and these, these, these houses. Um, and a thing, so soap operas, ongoing stories of ordinary people. Now, I've kind of defined them as being sort of people in general rather than something very specific like a, like a, a series about, you know, the police or whatever. Um, so places are really important. And often what the books are doing is giving you something you might not have got on the radio, which is a, a vision of what the place looks like which here it's done in sort of semi-abstract form. Mrs. Dale, um, talking about 10 years. So, is it a novelisation? Quite difficult to novelise soaps because there's such a lot of, of them. You know, there's like thousands of episodes, loads of things happening. You probably wouldn't want to read a book that sort of just recounted like the substance of like two episodes. So this is sort of a, an overview of a long period 
that's one way of doing it. So we've had a continuation, we've had the kind of looking back, given that she already writes a diary, this is like another di <laughs> a diary. She's a diary. She's re-diarising it. To <laughs> okay, and I've got uh, the Dales of Parkwood Hall is another, another kind of novelisation. Um, whether one is an avid follower of the Dales or not, the Dales of Parkwood Hill, not Hall, makes fascinating, entertaining reading. One finds oneself saying, surely they must be real people. <laughs> nice little drawings. Um, not quite sure. I think this is another... Um, if I see, yeah. So this one focuses on different characters in the show, which is another approach is to rather than novelise particular things you've already heard on the radio, is to give you sort of extra stuff about particular characters. And then my favourite one, Mrs Dale's Bedside Book. And it's John Quill Anthony again. Um, there she is, now with a dog. Um, uh, there's Mrs Dale's actual signature. So the Bedside Book... It's a mixture of things, so it's organised by month, and for each month you get a some things like Mrs Dale's favourite poems, or poems that Jim likes, that she's <laughs> included. Um, little stories uh, that are sort of vignettes, interesting things she's cut out of the newspaper, um, recipes, you know, so these are, hang on a sec, it's like, extra reality stuff coming out of the characters um so you know mrs dale herself that famous real person has given us given us all this material and a and a really lovely illustration as well so and again you you, you get things like this a lot as we shall see then we move on to the big dog the Archers. So The Woo! Archers is a radio soap that has been going, still is still going. Uh, so began broadcasting in 1950. So there's all sorts of amazing statistics about it. You know, there were people who performed in it for like 70 years. Um, and it started off uh, partly to achieve an agricultural kind of education uh, task. So... Uh, Famously commissioned, we want a farming Dick Barton. So Dick Barton, popular railway, railway radio serial, uh, a thriller in 15 minute episodes, each one with a cliffhanger. Um, so let's have that, but about farming to help tell farmers cool stuff they need to know about agriculture. And that element has dropped away in favour of the uh, more character based stuff. Uh, they, they live in a fictional village called Ambridge, you know, I believe a fictional county called Borsetshire. Correct. Um, and again, Based on Worcestershire. sense of place, okay, so you get a, a big uh, a wraparound cover, my favourite, <laughs> um, you, you get, you know, you can immerse yourself as a book owner in the, in the place with this lovely drawing. Uh, the Archers have brought to millions of listeners a feeling of real understanding and participation in English country life. They have. Day by day, a multitude of old and young listen eagerly to the unfolding of the life of the people of Ambridge, a chronicle of hopes and ambitions, fears and disappointments. Joys and sorrows, which are part of the fabric of life in the country. The spoken word passes away. So here is a per permanent record written by the authors whose skill created these characters of dramatic and stirring events that for a time rocked the peace of Ambridge. So you're getting a sort of um, some highlights again. Can I sing the theme tune? OK, now we have Dr Jenny singing a theme tune. Dumpty 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 dum, dumpty dumpty dum, dum, dumpty 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 dum, dumpty diddly dum. Then, television starts. First TV soap opera, The Apple Yards. Children's programme, though that's a... Uh, went, went out once every two weeks from 1952 to 1957. 
They had at least two books. Here is one of them. The Apple Yards again by David Edwards. David Edwards, who was in the show, I believe. Um, Ordinary Family's Life, that again. And I like the illustration. You've got cut out heads of the characters placed onto cartoon drawings. Funny. I like it so much I threw it on the ground. Um, so that was the Apple Yards. Then you get the Grove family, 1954 to 1957, the first television soap for adults on the BBC. Meet the Groves. Uh, again, so rather than place, you're seeing the people on the cover. Again, with the cut out heads, row of cut out heads lined up on the spine. Um, nice shots on the cover. Again, the authors are also the creators of the show. This was a prize. Linda Holt, who got 406 out of 416 marks, chose this as her, her prize. Uh, the phenomenal success of the Grove family, with its weekly appeal to 10 million television viewers, Blimey. which would be high even now, proves yeah. that the demand for stories of simple everyday happenings is as strong, if not stronger, than the demand for crime fiction or romance. Um, so many new episodes in the life of this lovable family. So another approach, rather than sort of novelising anything that's happened, give folks some extra stories. Meet the Grove family. Bob Grove, dad to his children, a builder by trade, who believes that life and houses should be based on solid foundations. But, he, but be nonetheless jolly on that account. Dad it is who makes the plans, but second heading... Gladys Grove, mum, carries them out with a warm-hearted efficiency and an infallible understanding of what goes on in the minds of their four children. Four children, each of which have a, their own subheading. Pat, trip dispenser. The firstborn is a romantic girl, more attractive than attracted, for she cannot decide to take the plunge with any of the suitors who try to persuade her. In this respect, she differs from her brother, Jack. A natural pushover for pretty face or a get rich quick proposition? Who never stops to inquire whether the ice will bear or how deep is the water beneath? Lenny, 10 years younger, sprightly little boy, oh. careering through a jungle of joyous but imaginary adventures, taken with the greatest grain of salt by everyone except his smaller sister Daphne, who shares his love for make believe because she does not consider impossible happening, happenings are in any way improbable in such a happy word. Finally, you're invited to meet Gran. I'm guessing this is Gran. Who came for a week and stayed for good. Shrewd, bluntly outspoken, fearless and forthright. She is a warrior of the old school, still in the front line, fighting fit at 90. So, yes, the Grove family. Television. Uh, partly called that because BBC had studios at Lime Grove and I believe it was filmed live. Um, so um, still they used to do that in those days they? They, yeah almost um, yeah I've even read a kind of an article in the press with, is it really television if it isn't live do yeah. we want them fobbing us off with these pre-recorded <laughs> programs then there's one that we doesn't seem to have had a book star and company um, then we get compact compact compact, compact. So Compact, a soap that was about a, a fashion, a fashion magazine, Compact, and that had books. It had three paperbacks at least. Well, I've found two of them. Here's the second one, Compact Two, by Janet Grey. Yeah, beautiful oh, cover. The way they've used pure, pure colour areas to make this zesty cover graphic is brilliant. Um, Compact, the BBC television series. So that was on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Hardly an exaggeration to say it's become a national institution. Numberless viewers cut all sorts of appointments in order to keep that famous 7.30 date. They don't want to miss any of the ups and downs of the magazine Compact or the problems of its staff. Um, 
And this does seem to have been a kind of retrospective novelization, a kind of overview of that series, um, and which was written by Hazel Adair and Peter Ling. You get photo sections as well. They're very proud of a outside broadcast filmed episode in South End, which pops up in all sorts of places. And I've read it was like national news that they'd actually done this. There was press cuttings from all around the country about this South End boat trip that the characters from Compact took. And um, tie in single. Cleo Lane, jazz singer, was a guest star in the episode and produced a novelty Cockney single, which I challenge you to listen to the whole thing because I've not, I've not managed more than about 30 seconds. So Je Jenny demands awful. it comes off after about two seconds. It's just so, so dreadful. South End by Cleo Lane. Anyway, yes, so that had that book, Compact 3 also by Icon Books. Now I can barely open this one because it's so crumbly. Um, but again, lovely graphics. Um, talking about 10 million viewers again. Icon Books. Um, other fiction titles in this series. Obviously they mean the imprint of the paperbacks as the series. Let's imagine they mean the other fiction titles are related to Compact. One of them, Stranger on the Shore, as per previous video, is a novelisation, is not a soap, um, but could, could it exist in the same universe? Um, the, um, the teenage girl in the, in the family where the au pair is working in Stranger on the Shore, Compact would be the kind of magazine she would read. Or possibly the competitor magazine to Compact that is called Lady Fair. So, other title in the series, Stranger on the Shore. Um, then, also headed other fiction titles in this series, Aisha, The Return of She. <laughs> so, <laughs> H. Ryder Haggard's Undying She Who Must Be Obeyed could possibly exist in the same universe as Compact. It would actually be quite good. You can imagine her owning a fashion fashion magazine can, yeah. um, in her eternalness and yeah. beauty. In fact, who better who better to front up a fashion who fashion indeed. magazine? Uh, so compact. Another thing compact had that most British of things, an annual, a hardback yeah. annual. Anything that was popular, or that somebody wanted to be popular with younger people, get one of these hardback annual out in time for Christmas. And um, this one's lovely. Uh, again, you get the, the cutout, cutout heads. You get fiction stories. Um, the first one actually is one of the characters um, on holiday. So it's bizarrely illustrated by pieces of diving equipment. Um, lots of behind the scenes stuff. Interesting intro where the, um, the guy forward comparing it to the old film serials um, where you know you'd get the sort of cliffhangers on things like Perils of Pauline um, also um, relates the, the ancient folk art the ancient craft of storytelling so setting the bar quite high um, you get lots of stories again these these strange cutout graphics and recipes so a bit like Mrs. Dale, you can, you can, all of your senses can be in the world of compact because you can not only watch it, you could also make meals that characters are fond of. I beg you don't. Robert, well, the trouble is, so Robert Desmond, Adrian, likes, is keen on continental dishes with lots of spice. Okay, particular favourite, chow mein. And the spices it tells us to use, salt, sugar and flavouring. <laughs> we're pretty much on our own. Or there's this other guy who likes his medallius, medallions of the old Janus. Okay. Good. Compact. Um, not many left. The newcomers. I wish that did have a, um, a book because that sounds really interesting. That was a television one. Um, 
Londoners moved to a new town out in the countryside. Fantastic idea, but didn't seem to get a book. A radio one called Wagoners Walk did. And this was on Radio 2, so that's on a sort of more popular station. Uh, again, lasted quite a long time. I've okay, so Wagoners oh, Walk. I never listened to Wagoners Walk. I actually thought it was about a guy called Wagoner who walked to places. <laughs> well, that would be quite a good way. He, he walks over. Oh, hello, so Mrs. So Smith. Psycho, I've just think. walked over here to find out what's going on but no wagoners walk again it's a place it's a street um it is. with a long history and again that's another thing you know the pseudo histories of places you, you you get built into these and this is another one that came out after the show had finished so gone is the respect respectful by arrangement with the bbc now you get when the bbc brought this phenomenally successful radio serial to a sudden end Thousands of faithful listeners thought they would never know whether Sophie Richmond accepted George Underdown's proposal for marriage, etc., etc. So now the story continues. So uh, hardcore fans, get your fix of Wagoners Walk, which brings us right up to date with EastEnders, who, as well as those uh, Hugh Miller books, also has annuals. And I th actually think they still get these now. Um, so this was mid '80s. Um, starts with a rather wistful watercolour painting of Albert Square and um, all the usual annual stuff including of course the obligatory recipes so you can you know, as well as pin-ups of characters like Mary the Punk um, you get uh, you could have uh, yeah gefilte fish as as cooked by Dr Legg for example so that is my penance for misspeaking <laughs> about BBC soap operas, an overview of all of their tie-in books. Um, I particularly like the, I like a lot of them, I really like the compact stuff. Um, and um, Mrs Dale, Mrs Dale is very, com is very comforting as well. I could imagine reading segments of Mrs Dale um, as intended, uh, as, as, as bedside reading. Okay, wrap it up, long one this. Um, finishing with random sentence from a sword and sorcery book perhaps before continuing with this chronicle of the bloody years it might be well were I to give an account of myself and the reason why I traverse the Pictish wilderness by night and alone back soon or something else <laughs>